Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Monster Leviathan by Aaron Betsky, published by MIT Press. Lurking under the surface of our modern world lies an unseen architecture, or an architecture. It is a possible architecture, an analogous architecture, an architecture of anarchy, which haunts in the form of monsters that are humans and machines and cities all at once, or takes the form of explosions, veils, queer, playful spaces, or visions from artwork and video games. In The Monster Leviathan, Aaron Betsky traces an architecture through text, design and art of the 20s and early 21st century and suggests that these ephemeral evocations are concrete proposals in and of themselves. Neither working models nor suggestions for new forms, they are scenes just believable enough to convince us that they exist, or just fantastical enough to open our eyes. The Monster Leviathan gives students and lovers of architecture, as well as those hoping to construct a better, more sustainable, more socially just future, a set of tools through which they can imagine that such other worlds are possible. As Betsky eloquently articulates, an architecture already exists and does not exist at all. It is the myth of building, and all we have to do is find it. I had come to architecture after the belief in utopias had faded. No longer would the discipline solve problems and build a better world. Architecture could be fun, or it could be a warning sign of dystopian images, or it could try to rebuild an imagined former order, whether modernist or neoclassical. But it could not and should not pretend to build a perfect or even perfectible environment. Instead of utopia, I found the dystopias of science fiction worlds and the endless labyrinth of science into which postmodern and deconstructivist architecture devolved. Yet, always, there was the echo of something else, something that I felt architecture could and should be doing. Some said architecture was dead, while others thought it was just a form of communication. I continued to look for forms and images that might haunt this present world of limited possibilities and prospects. Before they tore down the old train station, my father and I would drive there on Sunday morning to the one newsstand that carried the London Times. My father would wait in the car while I picked up the paper. One time, when I got back into the car and started leafing through the sections, there was a monster leviathan spread out across the front page of the art section, a sea-striding metallic monster approaching New York. It was Ron Heron's proposal for a walking city, and its memory stayed with me. I encountered the Leviathan again when I read the Frank Lloyd Wright essay that is the subject of this book's first chapter. Over the years, I found more monsters in architecture. Sometimes they were near literal, such as the factories designed by Albert Kahn or the beast devised by John Haydock. Sometimes they were metaphorical or landscapes that were somehow both alive and architecture. In recent years, they have often been only the ghosts in the machine that slip away behind the face of my cell phone as I look for the latest building tidbit. Imagine a young person in architecture. Filled with dreams of building a better world, they toil in an architecture office serving clients they do not know. Their work consists of helping to design efficient boxes. They wander the streets of the city or town where they live, both admiring what past architects have left them and feeling they can do better than most of what they see around them. 
They see a world full of human energy and violence, aspiration and nightmares, achievements and failings. On and in this world they want to operate. Now, imagine that young person is Frank Lloyd Wright, who has actually managed to open his own office and is busy designing structures that, in his own phrase, break boxes rather than just build them. He can do so because he is living in Chicago at the beginning of the 20th century. It is a city that is exploding, growing at a rate and scale most people who experience it find astonishing. Opportunities are everywhere, but so is social and economic injustice, along with filth and pollution. Wright, as member of a new generation of designers, thinkers, artists and activists, is asked to speak at Hull House, the settlement house Jane Hall, who will later win a Nobel Prize for her work, has started to provide opportunities for workers through education and what we today would call networking, to better their lot. Hall House also serves as a hub for those who believe in building that better world. Wright calls his lecture, which later, in a manner typical for him, he revises many times, eventually into a completely different form, the art and craft of the machine. How does architecture contribute to such an effort? To answer that question, Wright focuses on what he sees as the engine of all these premises and problems. That is, he presumes, exactly the engine, the machinery and technology that are mechanizing countless tasks, driving mass production, allowing for jumps in speed and scale that happen every day, and, at the same time, producing a world that is become less and less recognizable. The human-made environment is losing its human scale the trace of the human hand, and any sense of a human community that together inhabits, continually remakes, and knows its environment. Things are changing too quickly and in ways that are not comprehensible to the senses. As Wright puts it in his address, the machine goes on, gathering force and knitting the material necessities of mankind ever closer into universal automatic fabric. The engine, the motor and the battleship, the works of art of the century. The machine is intellect mastering the drudgery of earth that the plastic art may live. The task of the architect, or of any artist, is then to figure out how to use that machine. That is easier said than done. As Wright points out, the machine encompasses not just actual tools and devices, but the large processes of mass production, enhanced locomotion, mechanical systems such as lighting and heating, and also a taste culture that accepts the aesthetics that is the natural outgrowth of all this technology. In this, Wright was just one of the many voices around the world trying to define what was happening to the world into which they had been born and that was, through means they both could see and often found difficult to understand, changing into something they did not recognize. That change was, in fact, the biggest part of what they were grappling with. The continual movement of people, words and idea, as well as the continual making and destruction of things, ideas and even people, was the tenor of the time, if there was one. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.